Savas is the perfect example of why finding a really good PhD student is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because he comes to my office three times a day and normally he doesn't leave unless I kick him out. That's also a blessing because what he wants to talk about is invariably really high level, very interesting scientific stuff, which is a very welcome distraction when you're waiting yet another boring report that no one will ever read. He's originally a civil engineer, believe it or not, and then he decided to take our masters, which is where we met. He took our module, my module, and was asking questions all the time, so I, I can't even say that I wasn't pre-warned. But he, he must have liked it because he then decided to do a PhD with us, which is doing on the application of our imaging methods to uh, tissue engineering, which is expected to play a very important role in the future of medicine. So during the project, uh, not only has he developed and honed uh, his physics and imaging skills to a very high degree, but he's also developed this amazing ability to interact with the medical community. And you don't need me to tell you how important that is for the sort of research that we do in the department. So if you want to take him along to your next meeting with the medics, maybe you can borrow him from us for a very small fee. <laughs> and with that, I'll hand over to Savas and his med new medical, uh, new imaging applications for tissue engineering. Hi, um, thank you Sandro very much. I mean, you oversold me a bit, so anything I present now is not going to be adequate up to the standard that people are expecting in the audience, unfortunately. But I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to try my best, though. Um, so today I'm going to present to you one of the uh, chapters of my PhD thesis, which titles Guiding the Tissue Engineering of Anisophagus uh, Using X-rays. This is a multidisciplinary project which is supervised by uh, Professor Sandro Olivo and Professor Paolo De Copi in the Institute of Child Health. So um, the case of esophageal abscissia is when the esophagus goes to a plant and the pod instead of being connected to the stomach. So visualize it as if there is a gap along the length of the esophagus. And if that gap is short enough, then the clinicians can actually pull the two sides together and rejoin the esophagus. However, if this gap is long, there is no current therapeutic option. A possible solution to this problem is to have a tissue engineer construct which can be transplanted in the esophagus and therefore bridge the gap between the two sides of the esophagus. The general requirements in order to have a tissue engineer uh, um, const construct are cells, the scaffolds of interest, growth factors, and then you combine them together, you put them in incubation in a control environment, and you have your final product. The work in ICH is currently in in vitro stages, and we're working with piglets. So we have the native samples extracted from a piglet, which is then decellularized, so it's stripped out of its cells in order to have the scaffold sample. Then the appropriate cells found in the esophagus are seeded in the scaffold. It's put in incubation for 10 days, and we have the final decellularized in vitro matured organ. And as a final step, before imaging, we critically point line our samples. Of course, the current gold standard for assessing the construct is histology. However, as you know, histology is destructive, is limited to a single orientation of dissection, and it can actually go really long with the waxing, and if you get the wrong orientation, then you lose uh, information. It doesn't allow of the extraction of non-destructive volumetric microarchitectural information of the sample, and at the same time, it doesn't allow quantitative intra and sample uh, statistics, so comparison. A potential candidate is X-ray tomography. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the uh, conventional attenuation-based X-rays, which relies on the degree at which X-rays are attenuated in order to create contrast between different uh, tissue in a sample. This is an esophagus, by the way, tomography slides. However, as you can see, and as you already most probably know, X-rays suffer from soft tissue contrast. However, if we exploit the fact that the X-rays are also phase shifted as they travel through a material, and we have a device that can actually capture phase shift, we can have soft tissue contrast, and at the same time, we ca can have a density map of uh, the material we're imaging. Having a closer look, the phase-based image compared to attenuation-based, you can see 
maybe not so well on this screen, but we can distinguish the four uh, esophageal layers of interest in the image on the left, and it's quite uh, challenging on the attenuation-based image. And then this is uh, the system uh, developed by Sandro, uh, and it sits on the second floor of medical physics, called the uh, edge illumination uh, system. Of course, all of the findings that we have with x-rays need to be confirmed with a current gold standard. So this is an example of a native sample and that we actually image first and then carried out uh, histology, HNE, which is the standard histology that the clinicians are currently carrying out. As you can see, all features, all features that can be identified in the histology are also visible in the x-ray uh, sample. And as this is a density map of the actual sample, regions that are cell rich, like the muscle layer of the sample, are gonna appear bright, which means dense, and empty regions like the lumen of the esophagus, of course, is gonna appear as uh, dark. An example of a scaffold sample, which is cell-free, <coughs> and the intensity of the walls now are, are significantly reduced because now it's uh, deceduralized, so stripped out of the cells. <coughs> and then this is a case of a deceduralized sample, which I put in the parenthesis half seeded, because at this stage the clinicians seeded cells in, on the one side of the sample only. This is immunostaining and h and &E on the same sample, and you can see that this region is populated with cells, it appears bright on the x-rays, and then regions that appear uh, less dense on the x-rays are the ones that did not, they have no uh, cells. And an example of fully seeded sample, where it's evident when comparing with the previous one that this one is fully populated with cells, along with the corresponding uh, histology. So what can we do with our uh, images? As I mentioned before, uh, histology suffers from uh, a single dissection orientation. In our case, we can actually use the different uh, images, stack them together, and have volumetric information independent of the orientation. So we can extract information about the sample in all uh, planes. Furthermore, we can have uh, a quantitative uh, map of the different layers found in the esophagus. And in this case, uh, following N1 to N7 from the outside towards the lumen of the sample, we can see um, the serosa, which is a connective tissue. Then we have a blood vessel, which appears uh, way less dense because it's empty. We have the two muscle cells of the esophagus. We have a very narrow peak, which is basically a connective tissue. I'm not quite sure if you can see on the screen, but it appears as a bright peak because connective tissue is dense. We have the loose uh, connective tissue called the submucosa, and of course, uh, the final layer, which is the mucosa and epithelium, which is uh, uh, bright and dense. In the case of the scaffold material, again, uh, we can distinguish all the different layers, but for this uh, slide, I want to highlight that uh, it is very important that we can confirm that volumetrically, all the different layers of the samples are preserved post deceduralization so after we strip out the cells of the sample. This is a sample, and the first thing that strikes your eye is, of course, that the entire microarchitecture of the sample is lost. We can observe a gradient from R3 to R4 of the cell population, so we can confirm from the images that more cells, uh, for some reason, tend to uh, populate towards the inner side of the sample, and that this is explained uh, due to the fact that during the tissue engineering process, there is flow of media through the lumen, and therefore cells are moving towards the lumen. And most importantly, the clinician said that it's crucial to know whether this deceleralization approach uh, took place uniformly across the volume of the sample, and I think that's something we can derive from our uh, volumetric images. Of course, uh, to have uh, more uh, detailed statistical analysis on the samples, uh, we need to mask out uh, the different samples, so isolate from the surrounding. In order to do that, uh, we have option number one, to do it manually which is gonna take ages because I have over 50 samples and over 4,000 slices to do manually, or choose the smart option of using a semi-automated approach developed by Alessia Atzeni, which is a fellow CDT student, and the only thing you need to do is basically input the first segmentation image that you've done manually, the last one, and then everything in between uh, happens for you automatically. As I mentioned before, uh, the actual image is a density map of the sample. And if we use the tissue mask that I showed you before, we can isolate the sample. And then for each slice, we can have the average density uh, value of the sample. Of course, we can plot the density variation along the volume of the sample. 
And for this example, I'm demonstrating a native sample, a recellularized sample, and a scaffold. Both the native and recellularized samples have higher density values than the scaffold. And then this makes sense because these two are cell rich, while this one is just extracellular matrix with no cells. However, we realize that as you go across the volume of the recelluralized sample, the density value drops the uh, value of a scaffold. So this raised the flag, and we checked out the images at the start of the volume and the end of the volume. And as you can see visually, it's pretty evident that the last slice has way less cells than the first slice. Then we brought that to the clinicians, and the clinicians confirmed to us that that end of the sample was the part that was clamped to the bioreactor, and therefore had no cell injections uh, close by, and therefore no cells populating uh, the sample. Of course, we can do the same thing for all samples, but if we want to have a statistical comparison between 50 or more samples, we need to express each sample as its own volumetric density value. And I think I know everybody knows where this is going. We put them together in different groups, and we have statistical testing uh, on the samples. We have the native, the scaffold, and the cellularized. And both the native and the cellularized show significant difference when compared to the scaffold. And then this is uh, some great news because you expect the cellularized sample to have higher density overall than the scaffold and similar density values to the native. So every time we actually extract a different sample from uh, the biological testing, we input in this population here and we see where it's actually going to be uh, sitting in the distribution. Another type of analysis that we can do is to compare the physical size of the samples. And of course, to do so, we need to have a normalized value of each sample. Because, OK, it's fair enough to say that all the samples are derived from the same peak type, but there is some variation because it naturally occurs. Therefore, we decided to express each sample as an esophageal tissue percentage. So how much of the sample is occupied by the tissue? This is a case of uh, three different types of samples. Apologies. This is a case from the same sample at three different stages. So when it was native, you had the 70% tissue percentage. A scaffold, it became 45% tissue percentage. So that's an indication that the walls of the samples uh, got smaller because now they are cell-free. And then upon repopulation, uh, the tissue percentage increased because now we have a populated uh, sample. Again, statistical analysis. Uh, both native and decentralized sample show significant difference uh, when compared to the scaffold. At this point, um, yes, this is indeed a confirmation that the decentralized sample uh, indicates that it's populated with cells because the walls are increasing size. But at the same time, this is an indication of the mechanisms at which the scaffold is repopulated. I'm going to explain to you uh, what I mean with this diagram. So we have our scaffold, then we have some cells injected in the walls of the scaffold. And then the cells, if I may, they have the free will to move outwards or inwards towards the lumen. If we observe an, an increase in tissue percentage, which obviously is a decrease in the lumen percentage, it implies that the, that the cells tend to move towards the lumen of the sample. And then we have the final uh, tissue engineer construct. This was discussed with the clinicians, and it was confirmed that it actually makes sense because cells tend to respond to external stimuli and shear stresses. And as I mentioned before, if we have the flow of growth factors in the center, in the lumen of the sample, then the cells tend to move towards those shear stresses. Of course, they grow and proliferate more at areas where they can find growth factors. And at the same time, the, sample, the, the cells tend to uh, favor regions that they have low density. So the cells have the option of either moving towards a connective tissue called the xerosa on the outside of the sample, or move towards the empty space, which is the lumen. And of course, they'd rather move towards uh, the uh, lumen. To conclude, we were able to demonstrate that we can integrate our X-ray technique with uh, the current gold standard, which is histology. We can extract volumetric information, which can be vital for the assessment of the tissue engineer constructs and scaffolds. We can have a visualization of the sample's microarchitecture. We can carry out quantitative intra and inter sample assessment. And of course, we can get an insight in the mechanisms of uh, repopulation. I would like to thank everyone from the Institute of Child Health, focusing on this guy, Maria Gilli, who is the postdoc that runs, uh, runs the show, if I may. And from the Advanced X-ray Image Group, uh, I would like to thank literally everyone, because uh, we're a team where everybody actually is there and helps everyone else.